Wow, thank you so much. It is great to be here. It's a great privilege of mine to, uh, to have all of you sitting here and uh, coming to hear this lecture. I wish I would have known uh, Dr. Rice better. I heard him speak a few times, but didn't really get to know him as a person. I've known many men who did know him and, and admired him. My, my greatest concern in, in coming here today was alleviated this morning. I was afraid that I might see Dr. Doran in a tie and then I'd be in big trouble. <laughs> But uh, he came walking down the hall, no tie. I can't remember the last time I wore a tie. So I was glad to see that, and now I feel right at home. Um, actually, I feel, I feel quite at home here anyway. Central, of course, is a sister school to, to Detroit Baptist here. Um, Dr. McCune was mentioned. Dr. McCune taught at Central for many years before he came here. I haven't quite forgiven him for making that move, but uh, I, I'm trying to get over it. Uh, Dr. McCune was, in many ways, um, he was my mentor. I don't know if he'd claim me, but I'd claim him. Uh, a lot of what you hear today is going to be just an echo of, of Dr. McCune. Uh, he, uh, he wasn't teaching theology when I was a student at Central, but he was teaching a lot of the Old Testament classes. He taught Old Testament theology. And sitting in his Old Testament theology classes, the, the Bible, even the New Testament, began to open up for me. It's like, oh, this is all starting to make sense. And later when I went into a THM and had to decide what uh, field to go into, it, it was a no-brainer for me. Like if I study the Old Testament and if that makes more sense of the New Testament, then I've got the whole thing, you know. And uh, Dr. McEwen really was very form formative in that in that area, and so I greatly appreciate him. I, I only disagreed with Dr. McKeon theologically a couple times. One was in, when my first daughter was born. She was born on a Saturday night, early Sunday morning. I was in church the next morning, and, and I saw Dr. McKeon, and I said, Dr. McKeon, you know, we just had our first baby last night. She's a beautiful little girl. I'm not sure I can believe in total depravity anymore. <laughs> <laughs> He said, talk to me in two weeks. <laughs> so I did come to agree with him again on that point. <laughs> Dr. McKeon also taught cessationism. You know, there, there are no more miracles today. There's no, no miraculous gifts. And uh, I always believed that until after he had moved here to Detroit. And uh, I saw a picture of him. And all of his hair had grown back. <laughs> You got to be pretty old to know what I'm talking about here, but it's like miracles must happen. McCune has hair again. It's like, I, so I'm still, I'm not sure about cessationism, but I, I, I believe in total depravity. Um, obviously, I've had a, had a lot of good friends here uh, who have taught here, and all the old guys, I, I can't mention them all or I'll forget somebody, but they've all been a blessing to me through the years. It's going to be fun while I'm here for just a day and, and a half or so to get to know some of the new guys. But in any case, it's a blessing to be here. It's a privilege and an honor for me to, to stand before you. We have tons of material to try to get through. The first session should be fine. We should make it uh, hopefully in time. The next two sessions, um, the, the second and third sessions are gonna be a challenge to get through the material. I can probably guarantee you that you're gonna be a bit frustrated at how fast we go. We're not gonna be able to look up all the texts that, that I wish we could look up. We, we do wanna leave some time for Q&A at the end. Um, but uh, all the material is here in the notes. Uh, they're very complete. All the texts are here. I hope you take this home. And you know, I hope today is just like scratching the surface and you'll take this stuff home and, and work through it and study through it. and. Uh, Feel free to email me with, with questions. Um, at, they're at central, first initial, last name at centralseminary.edu. Be glad to interact with you. I uh, can't promise you I'll get back the day you email me, but I will eventually get back to you if you have questions along the way or, you know, as long as we're here, we can talk at the break time or, or during the Q&A. Um, let's jump into uh, the first session. Maybe I should just do an overview first. Um, our first session is going to be a covenant concerned covenants in antiquity. 
And it, it has long been my um, conviction that the better we understand this form in the ancient Near East, the better we're going to understand the biblical covenants. Because I think God, God is the one who is, is sovereign over history. God is the one who designs history. I think he designed uh, these forms to use them in revealing himself. And I think the better we understand the form, the better we're going to understand the, the covenants that he himself contracted uh, in Scripture. So our first session will be the covenants in the ancient Near East. Second session will be the covenants in Israel, looking at Israel and the historic kingdom and the covenants under which Israel functioned. We'll try to squeeze in in the second session the Abrahamic, the Mosaic, and the Davidic covenant. I don't know how we're going to do that in 50 minutes, but we'll give it a shot. And then our third session, we want to look at uh, the, the new covenant, looking at the covenant for the kingdom to come. That probably will be where we'll bump into the most controversy, and, and uh, you won't all agree with me at the beginning. Hopefully you'll all agree with me at the end, but uh, we'll see where that goes. And disagreement is okay, and we'll talk more about that a little bit later. Let's jump into uh, ancient Near Eastern covenants. And again, I, I would submit to you that much of the misunderstanding about biblical covenants, in, in my opinion, much of that misunderstanding could be alleviated by understanding the way covenants work in, in the ancient Near East. Um, so, though this session won't take long, this session really is foundational for all the other ones. And I hope you just kind of get in your mind the way these ancient or eastern covenants work because it's going to be the basis for much of the, the argument and much of the discussion about the biblical covenants to come. Um, by definition, Roman numeral one, letter A, by definition, ancient or eastern covenants are legal instruments. That concept itself, in my opinion, answers all kinds of questions and, and draws all kinds of lines about how we should think with regard to uh, the covenants of, of Scripture, because covenants are legal instruments. Um, I have said to many of my friends who disagree with me on covenants, that uh, I'm never going to make them the executor of my will. Because if they can deal with biblical covenants the way they do, and there are all kinds of people involved in covenants that aren't named in the covenant, uh, it would make me very nervous about where my stuff would go when I die. It'd make my kids nervous too. Um, so as small as that point is, it's really, it's really kind of the big point here today. Covenants are legal instruments. They incorporate two essential elements, as I understand them. One is relationship, and the other is obligation. Obviously, a covenant is establishing a formal uh, recip reciprocal bond between specified parties. Notice that this bond is formal. This isn't just a, an agreement, you know, uh, I'm flying into Detroit, on whatever yesterday was, Thursday night at 11 o'clock, you know, will you pick me up? Yeah, I'll be there and pick you up. Okay, we, we make agreements all the time, but these are formal codified agreements. They're creating a, a bond between specified parties, and specified parties obviously, again, is a big part of what we need to remember when it comes to uh, covenants and biblical covenants. Covenants, by definition, in my thinking, uh, concern obligations. They, they are creating the, the codes that form the parameters and the procedures for this formal relationship. The formal relationship wor works within this circle and only within this circle, and it works this way within this circle. Um, and all of that is, is codified, it's agreed on, it's legal, and it's binding. Um, we need to remember that covenants are, again, they're not, they're not the same as a, an informal agreement. Uh, a covenant is not the same as a blessing in Scripture. There could be blessings in a covenant, but blessings are different than covenants or can be different than covenants. 
Covenants are not prophecies, and there are places where some theologians today get confused about prophecies and covenants. Um, there are many who believe prophecies can be fulfilled in some other way than literally, therefore covenants can be fulfilled in some other way than literally. Well, there are prophecies about covenants, but, but covenants are not prophecies. They're legal instruments, and you've got to keep those things distinct. They're distinct from promises and so forth. We just need to make sure we're not comparing apples and oranges when we think about the biblical covenants. So, a covenant is a legal instrument creating a relationship with obligations. Covenant terminology in the ancient Near East, of course, and you've heard this before, it, co you know, covenants aren't made, they are cut. The, the terminology of cutting a covenant is what you're looking for in Scripture. And, of course, in English, it's going to be translated to make a covenant. But um, covenants were, were cut, and there are all kinds of theories as to why that terminology is used. We're not going to get into that because I'm not sure anybody knows exactly why that terminology is used. You know, I guess we use that uh, times for cutting a deal, right? Uh, I don't know why that popped in my brain, but... But, you know, we use the same kind of language at times. Um, in any case, the concept of cutting a covenant in the ancient Near East is to legalize a formal accord or agreement. Let us see, there are basically two covenant categories that we need to think about um, when it comes to ancient Near Eastern covenants. The first one is an accord that primarily prescribes vassal loyalty. It focuses on the obligation of the inferior. When we talk about a vassal, the, the terminology that's used in covenants is, is suzerain and vassal. Suzerain is the, is the king, he's the conqueror, he's the, the leader, let's say, of a nation who comes in and conquers another nation, that nation becomes the vassal nation under this suzerain. The suzerain establishes uh, the parameters by which he is going to govern these people, and he will become their protector, he will become their, their provider, he will uh, care for them, and he will provide for them so long as they, right, keep the rules the way he wants them kept. Um, if they keep the rules the way he wants them kept, he will bless them. If they break the rules that, uh, and don't follow the rules that he has established, he will curse them. They will fall under the curses of the covenant. covenant. But the idea of a suzerainty covenant is that, that it's an agreement between a superior and an inferior and chiefly it concerns laws that are, that are governing that relationship and particularly uh, spelling out the obligations of the inferior. So as I say here, um, these kinds of covenants, I'm going to basically call them suzerainty covenants, are comprised chiefly of law. And I've put that word in, in small caps because it's a really important word when it comes to suzerainty type of covenants. Um, laws for the inferior parties with blessings for obedience and curses for disobedience. The main uh, kind of suzerainty covenants that we see in the ancient Near East and, and we will see in scripture is the suzerainty treaty itself. It's prescribing responsibilities of a vassal nation to a suzerain. So, as I said, here is a superior who is ruling a people's, a people group, and he's prescribing the laws that they must follow in order to fall under his protection and his provision. If there's war, he will protect them. If there's famine, he will provide for them. Uh, but they have to follow the prescriptions of his law. When you think of this suzerainty, treaty, think of national law, think of a group covenant, so to speak. Um, and, and we find these, again, in the ancient Near East in many different cultures. There is a, a suzerainty kind of treaty for an individual. It's called a fealty or a loyalty oath. 
This would be the responsibilities of a, of a courtier to, to, a, to a king or to a kingly person. These are the responsibilities of an official underneath him who has to follow these rules in order to you know, get their paycheck or have their paycheck withheld. We don't find individual <laughs> suzerainty or loyalty oaths uh, in the text of scripture that I can think of standing here on my feet, and I'm not, uh, you know, we're not going to talk about that. Uh, we are looking mainly at this national suzerainty treaty because that's going to come into play in the biblical covenants. And if you're thinking ahead on me, you're probably figuring out, you know, where that's going to fall. So we have two covenant categories. The first um, primarily prescribes vassal loyalty with the obligation of the inferior, and that's going to be the suzerainty treaty. The second <clears throat> is an accord that primarily rewards vassal loyalty. Rewarding vassal loyalty with focus on the obligation of the superior. Um, this is chiefly comprised of individual benefits with stipulations for ongoing distribution. So when you think of of this royal grant, as I'm gonna term it here. A royal grant typically is made with an individual. A suzerainty treaty is a national legal document that governs the relationship between the ruler and his subject people. That's a suzerainty treaty. Uh, a royal grant is a, a, a leader, a king, uh, a, a princely person of some status who has servants. Uh, one of his servants is extremely loyal. Maybe his father served before him. He is now serving. His son will probably serve. And the servant is doing an except, exceptional job. And so the, the master wishes to grant him benefits uh, because of his faithful service. Um, in this situation, the, the servant is not um, really, he's not really ex accepting or becoming a part of this covenant by his own oath. He's simply being granted this uh, kind of one-sided from the top down because of his faithful service. Um, his master says, because you have served me so faithfully for so many years, I'm going to grant you a piece of property on the edge of town, a large acreage. I'm gonna build you a nice house there. I'm going to fill your house with servants. I'm going to give you uh, enough property to grow your own crops and, and uh, take care of your family uh, so long as you and your children uh, serve me faithfully. You will have these benefits if, any of, if you or any of your, your children after you uh, fail to serve me, then those benefits can be withheld. But um, this is a royal grant. It's a warning favors to a faithful servant and his progeny, in most cases, uh, in perpetuity, so long as they remain faithful. So think of, again, a suzerainty treaty as a national covenant between a superior, a king, and his vassal people, and mainly it concerns laws for these vassals to follow. The royal grant is a, a, a princely person who's granting favors to an individual um, and he's doing that kind of by fiat. He's not asking this guy if he wants to agree to this. He's just giving it to him as a favor in perpetuity and, and, unless there is disloyalty along the way. So let me talk about covenant descriptors um, because I think there's a great deal of confusion about how we should, we, we should think of these two kinds of covenants. Have you ever wished that there was something that's, some terminology that's used commonly that you could like erase from everybody's mind? Uh, this is one of those areas in my mind uh, that is an unfortunate contribution to the way we think about covenants. And that is to think of covenants in terms of conditional versus unconditional. It's not just dispensationalists who use this terminology, and this terminology is very old. Um, and not only is it very old, it's still current in many uh, descriptions of covenants. 
Some covenants, it is said, are conditional. That is, um, the, the parties to the covenant have to meet certain conditions for things to happen. Other covenants are unconditional. That is, um, you know, it's just like they're, they're like given without condition. And, and typically the connection that's made is that suzerainty type covenants are conditional. You know, the king is laying conditions on the people that they have to follow, whereas a royal grant is unconditional. It's just coming from the top down. Nobody asked if you want this. I'm just going to give it to you. Um, remember, I suggested that covenants uh, are all um, covenants can be defined by relationship and obligation. All covenants create relationship. And all relationship creates obligation. So in my mind, it's really hard to talk about an unconditional covenant where there is no obligation. In fact, in the grant kind of covenants that we're going to look at uh, in Scripture um, and in ancient Near Eastern grant kind of covenants, there are obligations. Um, so it's, in my thinking, it gets very confusing and is somewhat misleading to think of covenants in terms of conditional and unconditional. I don't know that that terminology is ever used officially of covenants. On the other hand, I think it's better to think of covenants, number two, as bilateral versus unilateral. In other words, who is swearing to the terms? A bilateral covenant is a covenant where both parties are swearing to the terms. Think again, a suzerainty type of covenant. The king says to this vassal nation, um, I am swearing to be your protector. I am swearing to be your provider so long as you keep these laws that I have laid upon you and you agree to. Obviously, the, the vassal nation has to agree to the terms uh, before the covenant becomes in force. And so it's a, a bilateral covenant covenant where the suzerain is, is promising protection and provision and the vassals are promising uh, agreement to and the keeping of these laws in order to have that protection and that provision. Both parties are swearing to that covenant. A royal grant, on the other hand, is a, is a unilateral covenant. In other words, the receiving party, the loyal uh, the, the loyal individual servant who is being given the property outside of town with all the servants and all the acreage and so forth, um, he's not swearing to anything. It's the, it's, it's the superior who is swearing to give him these benefits. Now, again, you're not going to find any of those unilateral covenants where there is no obligation, even in Scripture. Well, I'm going to try to show that to you. You will find obligation. If this loyal servant no longer remains loyal, or if his son no longer remains loyal, there's no way I'm going to give him property and, and all of these blessings and rewards. And so um, I think there are conditions uh, to every covenant. I don't think there's really any such thing as an unconditional covenant. I don't think that terminology is helpful. I think it's better to think of covenants in terms of bilateral covenants where both parties are agreeing to the terms. That's going to be a suzerainty covenant. And then uh, a unilateral covenant where only one party is swearing to the terms. That's going to be the grant kind of covenant. So, now we've looked at the covenant itself. Let's talk about things that accompany covenants in the ancient Near East. And I've listed uh, three here that accompany these major kinds of covenants. And these three are symbolic elements, as I understand them. Covenants, some covenants in the ancient Near East, um, were accompanied by sacrifice. Sacrifice um, seems at times to signal the, the purification of the party who is uh, the parties who are who are partaking of this covenant that is the it's a sacrifice that in some sense is bringing 
you know, purity to the relationship, a cleansing to this agreement. Um, it also signifies, uh, um, can signify costly commitment. Um, you know, you, you think of the sacrifice, which we'll get to, with, uh, you know, with Abraham, where the, the animals are split in two. We'll look at other places where that happens. And God walks between the pieces. You know, there, there are often many say that that um, has some symbol of, you know, of commitment. Um, some, something had to die here in order to make this covenant, um, you know, symbolically costly. And also, I think, a sacrifice gives the covenant uh, some sense of legal certitude. Something happened again here where a sacrifice was made, an innocent victim died, blood was shed, um, which I think shows not only cost, but, but commitment. This is meant to be lasting. This is, this is a legal uh, instrument that's going to happen because of the cost that was involved in, in securing it. Um, again, you think of, uh, of the Abrahamic covenant where God passed through the pieces of the offering. The Mosaic covenant certainly had a sacrifice, and we'll look at that uh, in, in our second session. And the New Covenant also has a sacrifice, and we'll talk about that in our third session. Um, if you look at Jeremiah 34, I think we're going to have time to do this, and I'm going to use my computer here to look stuff up so long as it works for me. Uh, Jeremiah 34, verses 14 to 18 there's an interesting situation here, which I didn't take time to study in great detail, but um, obviously there's a law in Israel that uh, Jewish servants are supposed to be uh, released after a certain amount of, of time, after their service. Um, every seven years, Jewish um, indentured servants were to be released. Um, Jeremiah is receiving word from God that there are some in Israel who uh, have been observing this, this, some who have not been observing it. In fact, there are some who at one point made a covenant in that regard. Jeremiah 34, 13, thus says the God of Israel, I made a covenant with your forefathers in the day I brought them out of the land of Egypt, um, saying at the end of seven years, each of you shall set free his Hebrew brother and so forth. He says, verse 15, although recently you turned, you had turned and done what is right in my sight, each man proclaiming release to his neighbor. You had made a covenant before me in the house which is called by my name, but you turned and profaned my name. So at some point, a covenant was made by some parties to, uh, to be sure and release their Hebrew brothers every seven years. But now they have forsaken that agreement. Um, verse 18. I will give the men who have transgressed my covenant, who have not fulfilled the words of the covenant which they made before me, when they cut the calf into and pass between his parts, the officials of Judah. My point here is only that this cutting of animals in two and passing between the pieces, as happened with the Abrahamic covenant, was a common kind of sacrifice for uh, certain covenants, certain covenants. Uh, had sacrifices. Sacrifices could attend covenants. Um, some covenants, letter B, um, included a meal. The meal, uh, as part of a covenant contract, probably was indicative of uh, the proximity of the intimacy of these parties in the relationship, the sharing of a meal. And of course, we know with the Mosaic Covenant, um, when God was speaking to Moses, he had the elders brought up onto the mountain and they ate a meal in the presence of God. Uh, and so a meal is certainly connected to the, to the Mosaic covenant. Uh, there's an interesting text in, in Exodus 34, and I think we have time, so let's go there. Exodus 34, verse 15 God here is speaking to Israel about not um, fraternizing with the, the Canaanites in the land to, to which they have 
come or to which they are going actually in the book of, of Exodus. And here's what he says in verse um, 14. You shall not worship any other God. This is Exodus 34, 14. You shall not worship any other God for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, they play the harlot with their gods and sacrifice to their gods and someone invite you to eat of his sacrifice, to have a meal with him. Um, Making a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, part of which involved a, a sacrifice and a meal. So again, some covenants were attended by meals. The Mosaic Covenant, uh, again, we know was attended by a meal. Some suggest that the New Covenant will be attended by a meal. I really haven't done a lot of study on that. I, I know that some suggestions in that regard I disagree with. Uh, whether there is a meal, you know, whether the marriage supper of the Lamb or somewhere down the road there's a meal. I mean, Jesus did say he would you know, eat the Passover meal with his disciples again in the future. But we do know the Mosaic Covenant certainly had a meal. The third element or potential element in a covenant is the token. The token. The token serves as an ongoing indicator and reminder of covenant obligations. So it's some kind of a visible, tangible sign that is a reminder of this agreement. Um, the, no- the Noahic covenant, of course, had a token, and that token was, class, the rainbow, right? Um, who is the rainbow? Who is reminded by the rainbow never to destroy the earth again? Well, I just kind of gave that away, right? It's, the, the token is to remind God, it's a reminder, for God never again to destroy the earth by flood. The Abrahamic covenant had a token, class, circumcision. We'll talk about that. That was the sign of the Abrahamic covenant or the token. The Mosaic covenant had a token. This one's a little more difficult. Anybody know? Sabbath. Sabbath is the token were the sign of the Mosaic Covenant. That's why not keeping the Sabbath was such a disastrous thing because that's the sign, that's the reminder, the token of the covenant. Uh, look at Joshua 2.12. We're looking at other places where we find these elements. And in Joshua 2, we run into Rahab. And she is telling the spies, uh, verse 9, about her knowledge of Yahweh God and how they heard about the miracles uh, that Yahweh performed in bringing them out of Egypt. Um, That itself is an interesting thing to think about. Verse 11, she says, When we heard it, our hearts melted, and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. For the Lord your God, he's God in heaven. Verse 12, now therefore please swear to me by the Lord. Swearing is going to be a covenantal thing we'll look at in a moment. Swear to me by the Lord since I have dealt kindly with you that you will also deal kindly with my father's household and give me a pledge. The Hebrew word is oath, a token. Give me a sign of that uh, that covenant. Um, And so visible signs... um, Tokens of covenants were common in covenants, but not necessary for covenants. These are all symbolic elements. As I say here in conclusion to point E, symbolic elements that are not essential to covenants, they do not constitute covenant ratification, as I understand them. Number two, the the juridical element or the the legal official element that every covenant has to have, and in fact, that which enacts a covenant, is the oath. An oath legally ratifies, actuates, makes valid, and acts a covenant. In other words, though sacrifices and meals and tokens were possible symbolic elements in covenants, oaths were the essential element 
of a covenant because an oath is that which enacts the covenant. Let me illustrate that um, this way. Here's the illustration I use in my classes. Um, Imagine for a moment a, a wedding ceremony. There are all kinds of things that happen at wedding ceremonies, and of course wedding ceremony, ceremonies ultimately are leading to an official legal covenant, right? You, have, you may have the, the, the bride's father giving his daughter away. You may have a, a unity candle Um, You have the exchange of rings. Here's the question I ask my class. Let's imagine that one of the parties, the the bride or the groom, dropped dead in the middle of this wedding ceremony. I realize this isn't a, a great illustration to think about. But the bride or the groom, one of them drops dead somewhere in the middle of this wedding ceremony. Here's the question. You know, are they married or are they not married? Well, it depends on when they drop dead, right? What's the point of legal marriage in the eyes of, I would say, God and the church in a wedding ceremony? At what point, if they drop dead, did they just lose a spouse? The vows. Exactly right, the vows. I mean, if dad has given her away, if they've done all kinds of other, you know, symbolic things, you know, pouring sand in a glass jar, whatever is popular these days. Um, They can do all kinds of symbolic things, right? But until the vow is spoken, they're not married. If they drop dead before the vow, they didn't lose a spouse. If they drop dead after the vow, they just lost a spouse. Let's think about the eyes of the state. That's the eyes of the church. What, what does the state want to know? When is, when is this marriage a legal marriage in the eyes of the state? Pardon? They sign the, the marriage license, right? Which is why you're, you're really supposed to have them sign it after the ceremony than before the ceremony. Uh, don't get me started on that. Um, so the state wants to see that signature, right? When, when is your... When is your contract with the bank with regard to your mortgage, you know, when is that a legally binding thing? It's when you sign the document. Think about all the stuff you see on the internet that you're agreeing to in that little box, you know, down there at the bottom. I've read all this stuff and I agree to it. Click. The minute you click on it, you're in a legal agreement. All right? So my point is, that which ratifies a covenant is the oath. You can have a sacrifice, you can have a meal, you can have a token. By the way, what's the token of that marriage ceremony? Right? It's right here. That's the reminder, the token. Right? So think of biblical covenants like you think of a marriage ceremony or any other legal agreement that you and I enter into There needs to be that, you know, signing of the dotted line, clicking the box on the internet, saying the vows in the the marriage. That's what makes the contract legal. Um, I've listed a number of references here. We go to 9.30, don't we? I think we have time. Let's look at a a few of these. Genesis 26, this is the essential element, co-equal with covenant. Genesis 26, 28. Genesis 26, 28. They said, We see plainly that the Lord has been with you, so we said, Let there now be an oath between us, even between you and us, and let us make a covenant with you. I've listed a number of texts here where the word oath is used in the same context as covenant because making an oath or swearing an oath is in fact making covenant. Joshua 9 is where we see the uh, Gibeonites. Joshua 
and their interaction with, with Israel, Joshua 9, 15. Verse 14, the men of Israel took some of their provisions, did not ask for the counsel of the Lord. Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live. And the leaders of the congregation swore an oath to them or swore to them. And again, we could look at uh, 2 Kings 11, um, Ezekiel 16, Ezekiel 17. You're going to find oath and covenant or swearing and covenant in the same uh verse, the same context, because an oath, to make an oath or to swear an oath is to make a covenant, that is, if the oath is made with regard to a covenant. You can swear to vows and other things, but my point again is that covenants are actuated by the oath. The other elements are symbolic. Let's go to Genesis 31, which is pretty interesting in this regard. Genesis 31, we have, you know, the whole account of Jacob and Laban. And Jacob takes off in the middle of the night. Laban eventually finds out and catches up with him. And in verse 44, they make a covenant. Genesis 31, 44. So now come, let us make a covenant, you and I, let it be a witness between you and me. Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar. Said to his kinsmen, gather stones. They took stones and made a heap and they ate by the heap. Okay, they're making a covenant. They raise up a heap of stones as a witness. Now the word token isn't used here, but witness or sign is used. Um, and so I'm, I'm assuming then that this pile of stones becomes the sign or the token, the visible reminder of this covenant, right? They're going to make a covenant, they create a, a visible reminder of that covenant, and they eat a meal. Um, Laban says, verse 48, this heap is a witness between you and me th this day. Um, verse 49, may the Lord watch between you and me when we are absent one from the other. We've all Heard that used out of context, right? Um, Laban said, verse 51, to Jacob, behold this heap, behold the pillar which I have set between you and me. This heap is a witness. The pillar is a witness that I will not pass by this heap to harm you, and you will not pass by this heap to harm me. It's a reminder. Again, the word token isn't used here, granted, but I think this is serving as a token. Um... Verse 53, the God of Abraham, the God of Nahor, the God of Father judge between us. So Jacob swore by the fear of his father, offered a sacrifice on the mountain, called his kinsmen to the meal, and they ate. I mean, you've got all these elements here of a covenant. That's why I like this passage. I just would wish it used the word token instead of a sign. But, but you've got all the elements here of a covenant. You have a sacrifice you have what I think to be a token, you have a meal. Those are symbolic elements, but you have the oath, you have the swearing of the oath, which creates the covenant between Jacob and Laban. So, I've listed here um, the Abrahamic, the Mosaic, um, the Davidic, and the New Covenant. And I've given you a number of texts that I don't think I'm going to take time to look at um, where you will find the swearing of or the, the oath taking with regard to these four covenants. And as we expand on each one of them in our second and third session, we will perhaps come back uh, to some of those texts and, and look them up. So here's my conclusion with regard to the ancient Near East uh, and the setting of covenant forms in the ancient Near East. And I kind of come back to my original thesis. If we're going to understand the covenants of Scripture, we need to understand the way covenants work in the ancient Near East. And all kinds of mistaken ideas happen with regard to covenants in theologies today and in theological systems 
Uh, I think because the, um, the author or the theologian doesn't really understand how covenants work. We need to understand biblical covenants, the forms, the formulas uh, of the ancient Near East in order to contextualize the covenants of the scriptures. And that's my first session and that's my premise for all of our other sessions. Now, I have five minutes, and our second session is going to cram a lot of stuff into it. So I kind of hate to do this, but I'm going to jump into the next page, um, which I is kind of my introduction to the next ses session, um, but I want to get this behind us. So don't forget everything we just said about ancient Near Eastern covenants. Please keep that in your brain when we get back to session two. But I want to take my last five minutes here and I want to basically read through this page for you. Um, and let me talk about it for a minute and you'll probably read through it before I get done talking. But maybe it'd be better to tell my class, don't read it now, look up here and then I'll read it for you. Um, this little chart, I'm a dispensationalist, right? I love charts. This is the, this is the Beecham chart. <laughs> Um, I remember when I was a kid, mom had Larkin's book, you know, and I'd pull that thing off the shelf and look at those pictures. I had no idea what it was, but you know, there were dragons and all kinds of cool stuff. Um, and then uh, as I got older and I began to understand dispensationalism, I mean, the charts became more understandable to me and interesting to me. And then I made the mistake one day, I can't remember how old I was, I think it was in college. I made the mistake one day of reading the end of Larkin's book. I see a few old guys smiling here, where he gets into pyramids and all kinds of weird stuff. And it's like, okay, well, that kind of shoots that whole idea. Anyway, this is Beecham's chart. Um, and I, I use this chart, uh, I, I walk through this chart in my biblical theology classes. I have three Old Testament biblical theology classes. One is Pentateuch historical books. One is... Um, wisdom and poetry, and one is the prophets. And in all three of those biblical theology classes, the first class, every time, in all three of those, even if the students have had it before, they get this chart. Um, I teach dispensationalism, first day of class, they get this chart. I teach kingdom of God, first day of class, they get this chart. Basically what this chart is in my mind is, uh, is McLean's book in picture form. Um, I love McLean's book. I know you guys love McLean's book on the kingdom. Um, and uh, that book has put the Bible together for me. Dr. McEwen taught that class. Now I get to teach it. I mean, that put the Bible together to me in a way I'd never seen it before. And this encapsulates uh, the way that I think about biblical, not just biblical history. This is the way I think about history from beginning to end. Okay. Uh, and the reason I'm bringing it to you here, and I'm going to read this for you, is because when we look at the covenants um, of Israel, right, the Abrahamic, Mosaic, Davidic, they fit on this chart. They're part, part of well, what Dave was talking about. The way God is working in history, um, part of the way he's working in history is through covenants. Those covenants have to tie to ancient Near Eastern forms, and we have to understand them the way uh, you know, the way that covenants work because God's using that form with his people through history and through time. Um, but I want, to, I want you to see the way I think of, of history so that you'll understand a little more about what I'm doing with the covenant. So it's going to take me about a minute and a half or two minutes to read through this. Um, let me just read through it uh, with you or for you. The unique and infinite God rules over all of creation all of the time. That is God's universal, or I call it his macrocosmic rule. If you look at the top of the chart, you'll see God ruling over everything from beginning to end all of the time. God rules over everything all of the time from beginning to end. McLean calls that the universal rule of God. I'd like to steal some terminology from, uh, from the church and I call it the macrocosmic rule of God. Anyway, 
God rules over everything all of the time. Mankind, however, cannot fully perceive the essential nature and complexities of God's universal rule. These complexities are subjective with regard to human insight. God, from the beginning, determined to objectify the conceptual qualities of his rule, first through Adam and eventually through a God-ruled mediatorial kingdom. In other words, God objectified his rule over everything all the time by picking a people on the face of the earth and creating out of them a nation, and they now objectify to the world God's rule. Let me read, keep reading here. This theocratic kingdom would serve as a revelatory microcosm of God's macrocosmic rule. Through Israel, the chosen nation, God would demonstrate to the world the nature and qualities of God people, God law, God living, God mercy, God justice, and so forth. Theocratic national Israel would stand as a witness and a signal to the person and work of God and his universal rule. As such, Israel was to be holy as God was holy. This next little paragraph I, I try to prove to my listeners and my students why I believe kingdom is so important and how I can demonstrate to you that kingdom is the way God chose to reveal himself in history, kingdom through Israel. But I'm not going to read that paragraph. I don't have time. Let's jump to the bottom paragraph. As the kingdom of history declined in submission to the theocrat, the prophets warned of the dispersion of the kingdom, people, Israel. The theocratic kingdom of history would end, but would never be abandoned completely. The prophets spoke of a certain future restoration of the kingdom. The kingdom would return to Israel. Jesus, at his first advent, offered that restored kingdom to Israel in rejecting Jesus. However, Israel rejected the kingdom. The king departed. The kingdom was in abeyance, but the story was not over. Jesus would come a second time, having prepared Israel through jealousy and great tribulation to receive the king. At his second advent, the kingdom of history will be restored to Israel exactly as prophesied. The theocrat, the Messiah, will directly rule over Israel and through Israel over all the nations. He will rule until the created order once again stands in perfect submission to the Father, just as originally created. With the conclusion of earth history, Christ will turn the kingdom over to the Father, who will create a new heaven and a new earth as the everlasting inheritance of the saints of all times. That's how I look at history. That's how I'm going to put the covenants together in our second session. Can we close with a word of prayer? Father, as we read through those brief paragraphs and think about what you are doing in history and how you are doing it. Father, we would first of all praise you for who you are and what you are doing. It is astounding to us. We cannot completely understand it. But God, we would ask that you would give us greater and greater, deeper and deeper understanding into your work in history we pray that as we study these covenants, you would give us better understanding of your word and your work in history. Lord, we want to understand your word because it's through your word that we understand you, that we understand ourselves, that we see our need, and we cry out to you and we come to you, and we seek, Lord, you to accomplish your purposes exactly as you stated in your word. Father, help us to understand your word, to believe it, to preach it, to teach it, to live it, to look forward to the day when all of this will be restored through the work of Christ and the eternal kingdom of God will come where you will rule and reign on the new earth and we will be your subjects eternally forever and ever. Hasten that day, Lord, we pray, and bless our time together. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you.